It's also been reported uh, that there have been UAP observed uh, and interacting with and flying over sensitive military facilities, particularly, and not just ranges, but uh, some facilities housing our strategic nuclear forces. Uh, one such incident allegedly occurred uh, uh, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, in which 10 of our nuclear ICBMs were rendered inoperable. At the same time, a glowing red orb was observed overhead. I'm not commenting on the accuracy of this. I'm simply asking you whether you're aware of it. Uh, reportedly appeared to exhibit unusual flight characteristics appear to demonstrate advanced technology, uh, and some of them appear to remain stationary in winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. Um, More than 50 years ago, the U.S. government ended Project Blue Book, an effort to catalog and understand sightings of objects in the air that could not otherwise be explained. For more than 20 years, that project had treated unidentified anomalies in our airspace as a national security threat to be monitored and investigated. In 2017, we learned for the first time that the Department of Defense had quietly restarted a similar organization tracking what we now call unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs. Last year, Congress re rewrote the charter for that organization now called the Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group, or AIM-SOG. For short, today we will bring that organization out of the shadows. This hearing and oversight work has a simple idea at its core. Unidentified aerial phenomena are a potential national security threat, and they need to be treated that way. For too long, the stigma associated with UAPs has gotten in the way of good intelligence analysis. Pilots avoided reporting or were laughed at when they did. DOD officials relegated the issue to the back room or swept it under the rug entirely, fearful of a skeptical national security community. Today, we know better. UAPs are unexplained, it's true, but they are real. They need to be investigated, and many threats they pose need to be mitigated. This is the open, unclassified portion of our hearing. We'll have a closed classified part later. It's important for the public to know that the classification of information exists to protect national security, not to try to hide the truth. The larger effort that is being undertaken to study and characterize UAP reports is an important step towards understanding these phenomenon, what we know and don't know. And I look forward to hearing more during both the open session and the closed setting about how DOD and the IC are undertaking that task. Uh, are these uh, phenomena that we can measure? That is, uh, instruments report there is something there. It is not the human eye confusing objects in the sky. Uh, there is something there, measurable by multiple instruments, and yet it seems to move in directions that are inconsistent with what we know of physics or science uh, more broadly. And, uh, that, to me, poses uh, questions of, of tremendous interest and uh, as well as potential national security significance. For example, let me share with you the first video that we have here today, which shows an observation in real time. There it was. That's, in many cases, that's all that a report may include. And in many other cases, we have far less than this. As we detailed in both the unclassified and classified versions of the preliminary assessment released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence last June, this often limited amount of high quality data uh, and reporting hampers our ability to draw firm conclusions about the nature or intent of UAP. For example, let me show you a couple of uh, another video and image uh, taken years apart in different areas. In this video, U.S. Navy personnel recorded what appears to be triangles, some flashing, recorded several years ago off the coast of the United States. This was recorded while the U.S. Navy ship uh, observed a number of small unmanned aerial systems uh, in the area. And importantly, the video was taken through night vision goggles with a single lens reflex camera. These remained unresolved for several years. Several years later, and off a different coast, U.S. Navy personnel again 
in a swarm of unmanned aerial systems, and again through night vision goggles and an SLR camera, uh, recorded this image. But this time, other U.S. Navy assets also observed unmanned aerial systems nearby. And we're now reasonably confident that these triangles correlate to unmanned aerial systems in the area. If UAP do indeed represent a potential threat to our security, then the capabilities, systems, processes, and sources we use to observe, record, study, or analyze these phenomena need to be classified at appropriate levels. We do not want, we do not want potential adversaries to know exactly what we're able to see or understand or how we come to the conclusions we make. Therefore, public dis disclosures must be carefully considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So we've been doing this for decades. We've been looking at the space domain, looking at space objects, looking at space weather, looking at space phenomenon. Uh, we've been looking at things in the air domain. And we, as you know, we, um, and I'll talk more about this in classified session, but we have a very concerted effort to understand adversarial platforms and adversarial developmental programs. And we do that also in the ground domain. And of course, we're very interested in what happens in the, um, in the underwater or sea domain, if you will, subsurface domain. So if there are objects that our uh, aviators or air crews are encountering in this air domain and their sensors are, um, are discovering or detecting some of these objects, we want to just bring that in to the normal process that we have for identifying unknown unknowns. We want to make sure we have the intelligence requirements that allow us not only to look at that event from the time that it occurs forward, but maybe retrospectively we want to go back and see if we can get to the left of that event to say, was there some developmental program that we, to get to your technical surprise uh, issue, sir, that we should have known about? Well, I have some concerns that many of the images that we see commonly um, in this committee and even in open source, the resolution and the clarity um, that would allow a, a robust technical intelligence analysis is challenging. So is AIMSOG uh, prepared to address the quality and, and quantity of data collected on UAP to advance intelligence collection? And do you have the adequate sensors you need to collect that high quality data? One of the lines of effort that we have is looking at our sensor capabilities and to understand whether or not, as the video showed that Mr. Bray um, displayed, uh, sometimes it's very fleeting uh, data that we have on some of these objects. And, and, and we want to make sure that one, uh, our systems are calibrated uh, to actually be able to collect on the objects. You know, our sensors today, are they're calibrated for specific things. We want to make sure to calibrate it for things of this nature, things of this size, things of this velocity, if I can use that term. We want to make sure that once we have that, that that data is stored in some standardized method uh, that we can then extract and that we can feed into our system real time. So we do not like want this to take some a uh, prolonged period of time for us to get that data. But our goal is absolutely to have that high fidelity information that we get from all sensors, and we want to be able to integrate that with what we may have off of ground-based sensors. Mr. Bray, can you rerun that first uh, image that looked like it was outside of a plane window? Um, and if you wouldn't mind going up to the screen and tell us what we're, what we're seeing. Uh, I, not that you can necessarily tell us what we're seeing, but right. explain what we should be looking at in that first image. Well, describe what, what we have seen in that. Uh, what are we observing? Uh, what you see here uh, is an um, uh, aircraft that is uh, operating in a, uh, uh, in a U.S. Navy uh, training range uh, that has observed a spherical objects uh, in that area. Uh, and as they fly by it, they take a video, you see a... Um, it looks uh, reflective in this video, somewhat reflective, uh, and it quickly passes by uh, the cockpit of the, uh, of the aircraft. And is this one of the phenomena that we can't explain? I do not have an explanation for what this, this specific uh, uh, object is. And is this one of the situations where it is, that's the, that's the object that we're looking at right there? Thank you. Um, and is this a situation where it was observed by the pilot, and it was also recorded by the aircraft's instruments. Uh, we'll talk about the multi-sensor part uh, in a later session. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have at least that. Um, in, in the Director of National Intelligence uh, 2021 unclassified report, um, the ODNI reported 144 
UAPs between 2004 and 2021, uh, 80% of which were uh, recorded on multiple instruments. Um, and I take it with respect to some of those, you had the pilot, a pilot seeing them if it was observed by a pilot, right. and you had multiple instruments recording it. So you really have three sensors, the human sensor and two uh, technical uh, sensors detecting the object, is that? For the, for the majority of uh, uh, incidents that we had in the uh, last year's report, uh, the majority had multi-sensor data. And that's the object we're looking at right there now, right? That's it right there. Okay. Um, last year's report also said that of those 144, 18 of them uh, reportedly appear to exhibit unusual flight characteristics, appear to demonstrate advanced technology, uh, and some of them appeared to remain stationary in winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. Uh, that's pretty intriguing. Uh, uh, and, and if you're able to answer this uh, in this setting, are we aware of any uh, foreign adversary capable of moving objects uh, without any discernible means of propulsion? Um, I think I would, uh, without discernible means of propulsion, I would say that uh, we're not aware of any adversary that can move an object without discernible means of propulsion. Are there any non-military reports coming forward of similar events, or is it all coming from military? Uh, the UAP Task Force has a very good working relationship uh, with the FAA. Uh, they have very good working relationship with other parts uh, of the U.S. government so that we can ingest reports uh, from um, uh, Do we have from, from any reports non-military? Yes. Thank you. That's, that's, that's my question. Do we, um, there are other people besides uh, the U.S. that have had these experiences and reported them? Is that correct? There are. That's correct. Uh, is it uh, all of our allies, or is it allies and adversaries? What have we learned publicly? So some of that, I think, sir, we'll save for closed session. A number of these UAPs, you said, we can't explain. Again, in the service of sort of reducing uh, speculation and conspiracy theories, we can't explain can range from a visual observation that was distant on a foggy night, we don't know what it is, to we've found an organic material that we can't identify, right? Those are radically different world, worlds. So when you say we can't explain, give the public a little bit better sense of where on that spectrum of we can't explain we are. Are we holding materials, organic or inorganic, that we don't know about? Are we you know, picking up emanations that are something other than light or infrared that could be deemed to be communications. Give us a sense for what you mean when you say we can't explain. Sure. Uh, when I say uh, we can't explain, I, I mean exactly as you described there, that there is a lot of information uh, like the video that we showed in which there's simply too little data uh, to, to create a reasonable explanation. There are a small handful of cases in which we have more data um, that our analysis simply hasn't been able to, uh, uh, to fully pull together a picture uh, of what happened. Mr. Moultrie, as the chairman uh, mentioned, uh, DOD had an initiative to study UFOs in the 1960s called Project Blue Book. It's also been well reported in our briefing and in, in other places that we have more, have more recent projects, specifically uh, ATIP. Could you describe any other initiatives that the DOD or DOD contractors have managed after Project Blue Book ended and prior to ATIP beginning. Did anything also predate Project Blue Book? So I, I, I can't speak to what may have predated uh, Project Blue Book. I mean, of course, there's Roswell and all these other things that people have talked about over the years. Um, I'm familiar with Blue Book. I'm familiar with, uh, with ATIP. Uh, I haven't seen other documented uh, studies that have been done by DOD in that regard. So you're not aware of anything in between Project Blue Book and a tip. I'm not aware of anything that's uh, official that was done. And whether you have any comment on the accuracy of that report. Let me pass that to Mr. Bray. You've been looking at UAPs over the last uh, three years. Uh, that data is not uh, within the holdings of the UAP task force. Okay. But are you aware of the, the report or that the data exists somewhere? Uh, I have... Uh, I have heard stories. I have not seen the official data on that. So you've just seen informal stories, no official assessment that you've done or exists within DOD 
that you're aware of uh, regarding the Malmstrom incident? Uh, all I can speak to is, you know, what's within my cognizance, the UAP task force, and we have not looked at that incident. Well, I would say, I mean, it's a pretty high-profile incident. Uh, I, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but that's out there in, in the ether. You're, you're the guys investigating it. I mean, if, who else is doing it? If something was officially brought to our attention, we would look at it. Uh, there are many things that are out there in the ether that aren't officially brought to our attention. So how would it have to be officially brought to your attention? I'm official. bringing it to your attention. Sure, so. This is pretty official. Sure. So we'll go back and take a look at it, but generally there is some um, authoritative figure that says there is an incident that occurred. We'd like you to look at this. Uh, but in terms of just tracking what may be in the media that says that something occurred at this time, at this place, um, there are probably a, a lot of leads that we would have to follow up on. I don't think we have a resource to do that right now. Well, I don't claim to be an authoritative figure, but for what it's worth, I would like you to look in, into it. And sure. if, if for another reason, you could dismiss it and say this is not worth wasting resources on. We'll do. Um, and then finally, are, are you aware of a document that appeared around uh, 2019, uh, sometimes called the Admiral Wilson Memo or EW Notes Memo? I am, I am, I am not. You're not. Are you trying? I'm not personally aware of that. No. Okay. Uh, this is a document in which, again, I'm not commenting on the veracity. Uh, I was hoping you would help me with that, in which a former uh, head of DIA claims mm -hmm. to have had a conversation with the Dr. Eric Wilson uh, and claims to have uh, sort of been made aware of certain um, contractors or, or DOD programs um, that he tried to get uh, fuller access to and was denied uh, access to. Um, so you're not aware of, uh, of that? I'm not aware, of Congressman. Uh, in my 10 seconds remaining, then, I, I guess I just would ask Mr. Chairman unanimous consent to enter that memo into the record. Without objection. There have been no collisions between any U.S. assets and one of these UAPs, correct? We have not had a collision. We've had at least 11 near misses, though. Do we have any sensors underwater uh, to um, detect on submerged UAPs, uh, anything that is in the ocean or in the seas? So I think uh, that would be more appropriately addressed in closed session, sir. Okay. Last question. Have our encounters with UAPs altered the development of our either our offense or offensive or defensive capabilities or even our sensor capabilities? It would take that for the closed session. Okay, great, thank you. Gentlemen, what seems incredibly difficult for you is that there's two almost competing but different uh, narratives. One is uh, it's, uh, the, no one knows whether there's extraterrestrial life. It's a big universe and it would be uh, pretty presumptuous to have a hard and fast conclusion. And then if there is, uh, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that there is some exploration coming here. Uh, and that underlies a lot of the reports you get. I think Mr. LaHood was asking about that. People think there must be extraterrestrial life and it's not at all uh, beyond the pale that uh, there would be a visit here. On the other hand, you, as the DOD, you have the responsibility to make sure uh, that our national security is protected and that if there are surveillance drones or uh, active drones that can disable our systems, uh, that has to be analyzed, has to be stopped. So how do you divide the, 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 how do you separate your responsibilities where uh, you get all these reports uh, from folks who uh, may be in good faith, maybe not, uh, believe that you should be investigating every possible uh, uh, report of a um, extraterrestrial incident? I'll start with you, Mr. Moultrie. Sure, indeed, Congressman, and, and, and thank you for the question. Um, it, it's important that we, um, as a part of this effort, uh, really uh, build out the relationship that we have with others, including NASA, and, and for the reasons that you just pointed out. So there are elements in our government that are engaged in uh, looking for life in other places, and they have been doing that for decades. Right? They've been searching for extraterrestrial life. Uh, there are astrobiologists who have been doing this too. We're a part of that same government, and so our goal is not to um, potentially cover up something if we were to find something. It's to understand what may be out there. What is it? What are we protecting? I don't know if you can answer this question uh, in this open forum, but in fact. Uh, your perception of what it is we have to quote protect. So I think right now what's really important for us to protect is uh, how we know certain things. So there are a lot of things that we know. Well, I, mean, I just have one, uh, a couple of real small questions. One is, uh, do we have an example? Can you cite a, a specific example of an object 
that can't be explained as having been human made or natural? I mean, the the um, the example that that I would say that, we, that is still unresolved uh, that I think everyone understands quite well is the 2004 uh, incident from, from Nimitz. Uh, we have data on that uh, and it simply remains unresolved. Just going back to the 2021 report, um, you know, under the category of UAP appear to demonstrate advanced technology, uh, those 18 uh, incidents uh, in which uh, some of the UAP appear to remain stationary, winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. Uh, it goes on to say, in a small number of cases, military aircraft systems processed radio frequency energy associated with UAP sightings. Um, I couldn't tell from that whether that small number of cases was a part of the subset of 18, that is, uh, among the 18, which appeared to move uh, with unusual pattern or flight characteristics, did some of those uh, uh, also uh, emit radio frequency energy? I would have to check with our UAP task force on that. I won't ask you in this setting, obviously, uh, to describe any secret DOD programs. That said, I do want to make sure the U.S. government isn't chasing its own tail. Um, Firstly, do you have a clear and repeatable process to check with compartmented programs about whether a UAP sighting is attributable to a U.S. aircraft? Uh, secondly, do, uh, does the AIMSOG staff have the clearances and read-ons that they need to investigate all of these incidents? And, 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 and thirdly, when your staff cannot be read on, uh, are your questions to those who are read on even being answered? So I'll start, and then uh, I'll, I'll pass that to, uh, to Mr. Bray. So we're very conscious of the potential blue-on-blue -blue issue or U.S.-on-U.S., -US. and so we've established relationships with organizations and entities that, um, that are uh, potentially uh, flying or developing platforms for their own interests, if you will. And our goal is to continue, and we have a repeatable process. I think we've had that process for some time to deconflict uh, activities that we may have to ensure that we are not potentially reporting on something that may be a developmental platform or a U.S. operational platform that is performing uh, either testing or performing a mission. And how, if at all, are you partnering with the Space Force to analyze UAPs? Uh, the UAP Task Force uh, has um, uh, has a very good uh, relationship uh, with Space Force, as it does with the rest of the Department of Defense. Uh, we have uh, pulled analysts in from Space Force to ensure that uh, uh, that we're availing ourselves of that expertise, uh, as well as um, uh, any um, uh, any other material they may have that would be helpful. And uh, Congressman, as you know, um, uh, Space Force and Space Command, they, they have responsibility for space domain awareness. So what we've done, we coordinated with, uh, with Space Force, we coordinated with their J2, and um, she is on board in terms of helping us plug into uh, what they have and for us to have this interactive exchange of information and data. And we're doing that with all the services, not just with Space Force or Space Command.